All right, this is the regular monthly meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education, Monday, August 12, 2019, at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti is absent. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. As a reminder, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board during the reception of visitors later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table to my right. And then we're going to go ahead and start off the night with the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, uh, the beginning of the night here is going to be our non-action reports. Uh, the spotlight on our school staffing update with Jane Uzentis. And for the audience, anyone who's got a tablet or phone with them, we did make the presentation for this public. All right, thank you. We wanted to spend some time tonight and update our board and community on our staffing and enrollment. Last May, uh, we did a preliminary presentation, and then we said we would come back early here in August to share where we are now and what our plans are and to talk again about our staffing targets. So this first slide is really sharing the work of the Resources Review Council, a council that worked throughout last year to set some initial targets um, Part of our goal is really to look at equity across the district and try to develop some system structures, protocols to um, be more equitable in our allocation of staff and, and also try to put some targets in place. And in our neighborhood school concept, our motto, which we love, uh, we do find a wider range of class sizes. In, in more recent years, we've, found, uh, we've moved a little bit farther apart and through the Resources Review Council, we're trying to come back together as far as let's, can we get our range of class sizes a little closer? Can, um, you know, if, as you see here with our, can we try to get to a place where 80% of our classrooms would in our K2 would have 24 or fewer, and then our target for 3-6, 80% of our classrooms having 26 or fewer students. Similarly, at middle school level, we set that same target, 80% of our classrooms, um, and with Specific to middle school, we talked quite a bit also about the difference in size between O'Neill and Herrick and um, getting the range closer together. What we had seen over the past few years is our class sizes at Herrick were more like 27s, 28s, and 29s more consistently, and O'Neill were in that lower 22, 23 range. So we made, take, took some steps this year to try to better balance um, the class sizes across our middle schools. The other part of our work involved looking at the other positions, our art, music, PE, teachers. Those allocations are much easier to do because they're based on num exact number of sections and so we can schedule so that our kids have weekly art, weekly music, three days a week PE or two days a week PE depending on their grade level. The positions that we will continue to talk about this year really are the teacher librarian, reading specialist, interventionist. We haven't even really gotten into um, really digging into the work of how do we make those decisions. Internally, our administrative team, we have obviously worked on that, but the, we, the council needs to, wants to better understand and we want to better communicate to our community our allocation. So currently, as you know, we have a teacher librarian at every one of our schools regardless of size, a school of 220, a school of 500, a school of 600. We have one reading specialist as well at each school. But that's, that's the work ahead for resources review. So now we get to the where are we as of last week. <clears throat> In this first slide, I wanted to share it a couple different ways. We have our OKEEP program, which is that enrichment, the optional enrichment program. And so in that first chart, the top, 87% of our students are enrolled in the OK program. And then I want to do the breakdown by building for AM only sections. We have 12% of our, of our children are in the half day, the AM only program. 
The other piece of information that's helpful when you're looking at, I mean, that's total number of students. At all of our schools, with the exception of Leicester, we have two, we will have two full-time kindergarten teachers. Um, and you'll see El Sierra was on that bubble. So we, tonight's agenda and the personnel report, we are hiring a half-time kindergarten. Um, but our conversations have been, we would make that a full-time position as well. So there will be two. Leicester with the 64 students is three full-time kindergarten teachers. Which then leads to that, the chart below, sharing with our board our average class sizes. We're very proud of the average class sizes. In kindergarten, we have met our targets of that 80% of our classrooms have 24 or fewer. In the afternoon sections, 100% of our classes are, are under 24. Um, and let me, I also took a look at the ranges, just to give you an idea. So for our AM sections, our class sizes range from 15 to 26. And in our PM sections, and that O'Keefe portion only, they range from 14 to 24. And so we have very low, what we would consider low, we, we haven't seen numbers like this in years. Um, but again, it's with the support of our board that we've been able to allocate staffing um, at our kindergarten level. Please stop me, board members, along the way if there's quite a bit of information here. I'll ask a quick question. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing that in the presentation, but where, in what buildings are you seeing kindergartens with class sizes um, in excess of 24? In excess of 24, I would say, let me go back. Uh, Highland, I want to, off the top of my head, I'm thinking Highland. Because there are only a few, I can, I can pull it up and tell you for sure. I'm just trying to do the math quickly in my, um, Lester would typically be, so I can get that to you, okay. Greg. The next chart, uh, I would just, again, looking across the district and trying to look at our averages. We have typically tried to balance and be relatively close with our average class sizes per building. We are closer together here this year than we have been in more recent years. We had average class sizes in some schools of 19 and in other schools of 25 and 26. So with some of our staffing decisions, we've brought that average closer together. And, and I also, if, as you notice, is presented with, with and without kindergarten because of the two different kindergarten numbers with the O'Keefe is one number and the AM is another. It, it would just become too confusing, honestly, in the chart. So we have, if you take kindergarten out, here's where we're at, and if we put kindergarten in. Um, and then again, across the bottom of those ranges, trying to look and see, are we getting closer together with the lowest class size and the higher class size? Okay. This chart then, so the what does it mean part of it. If you think back to those targets, the yellow shaded, are, would be the classrooms where we're not meeting our target. And I think we are still very proud as a district and as a committee, a council, of what we've worked on. We weren't expecting to really be able to hit that target in every area because there are some conversations we need to have as a district, as an administrative team, as a board, that drive some of these decisions. Our Resources Review Council obviously is not going to make a decision to add a staff member or to move a staff member. That really would be amongst our team. So what I wanted to share at least is in that grades one and two, the, um, the, the classes that are not at the 24 or lower, still the 25s, we're still very part of that. That's a good, nice number. Um, and 26, you'll no, you will notice the 31. And in El Sierra, first grade, as well as a 30 when you get down to the fourth grade, like those outliers, and then the sixth grade at Bel Air. So overall, um, we've, we're very proud of what we've been able to accomplish while also wanting to make sure we're very careful to recognize those larger class sizes. Part of what our council talked about is what, if, you, if you don't meet the target, the next step is really we need to communicate. We need to communicate well as to why and how are we going to support our students. That next level, that when you hit the 29 and more, that really triggers that action. Is there what additional support do we need to make sure our kids are getting an outstanding education? Uh, we feel our kids have gotten an outstanding education and will continue to do so. So, for example, in <coughs> Bel Air, um, Brent Borschelt, the principal, as well as working with his staff, 
held a parent meeting last May because he was anticipating this large, the large number, and that's really to help our parents understand. We, we have to try not to get focused on the number on paper. That is not, we have to focus on what does the learning experience look like and feel like for kids? What is happening in the classroom? And that's, and so when you're thinking of Bel Air and some of the supports that Brent has put in place, the reading specialist, the resource teacher, the teacher librarian, they all have that flexibility in their schedules in a smaller school to be able to dedicate part of their day, five days a week, to support that larger class size. So really, what the kids aren't going to be sitting in a classroom having a teacher lecture with 32 kids. It's really much more flexible groups, small group instruction, supported by the classroom teacher, but also other certified staff members. In addition, we have, with our larger class sizes, um, and I apologize, I forgot to mention for even some of the 27s, in some of those schools, the principal works with staff and they decide that there is an additional instructional assistant allocated to support the larger class sizes. So for example, at Leicester, the 327s, there is an additional adult that's supporting all three of those rooms. Um, Highland similarly has an instructional assistant. In any case, when we look at then Bel Air or El Sierra, we have a 31 in the first grade and that 30 in fourth grade. And so Jason Lind, the principal of El Sierra, has very purposefully looked at student data, looking at his staff, again, a smaller school, when you have the same allocation for reading specialist, teacher librarian, the same allocation that a school of 500 has, you absolutely have more flexibility in how you support the classroom. And so with, with El Sierra, uh, they will be utilizing the reading specialist. There's an interventionist as well, because El Sierra is a Title I school. Um, if needed, they also have the ability to use support from the teacher librarian and the resource teacher. El Sierra has two full-time resource teachers. Um, Bel Air only has one. And so there is more room in that allocation that could be utilized to support the classrooms. Again, the, the model of what the kids should be experiencing and will be experiencing is small group instruction with qualified, certified staff. Um, again, the assistants at El Sierra as well. El Sierra, also, again, part of our neighborhood schools and the, the differences in the allocations has five instructional assistants that are instructional support that can be used flexibly to make sure that they're supporting the different the needs of our kids. Um, so we do, we feel like our, our students will get a great education recognizing the 31 on the piece of paper or the 32, it looks, it makes you nervous. It, you, you start to wonder and worry and so that's where the bigger so it's more important that people understand what does it look like for students. I know that Jason, the principal of El Sierra, is working on, he's gonna um, offer a parent meeting to help his parents understand. He's written a letter that he'll be sending out to his parents because this is a recent, like hit, some of the enrollments are still coming in. All of these numbers most likely will change in just a week's time and definitely probably by Labor Day. Slight changes, but as we're continuing to get the numbers, um, Really now we're planning for that parent meeting at El Sierra as well. Is there, if there is additional um, move-ins or whatever, is it flexible that we could pivot and it reaches a point where just having a, a, an aid in, like you might need to split it or is it, is that not? We have um, added staff after the start of the year. It's not ideal, but it's the, the times that we've had to, again, we would consider each situation as it arises. Um, I can't say, you know, we wouldn't close the door and say no matter what, we, we would always consider the new information, whatever it looks like, talk about options, and so we have done that. So there's somebody available for that 32 or in El Sierra 31 at all times? Like, if it's not, not just reading. math or reading, like <clears throat> when you're in small group instruction, in other times, is there somebody that can, if if they need help, the they, they will, they're at beck and call, <laughs> kind of. The to instructional be able to assistants stay the in whole the room. day. And so there is at least one additional person with the teacher, but then we would have the flexibility, de depending on what, again, what the, the continuity was, or, you know, in some of the, maybe, you know, in science, if you're doing 
tables and, and uh, table discussions and you're circulating the teacher and the assistant, that would be enough support. But I guess the short answer to your question is yes. If there was another area identified in the day where we need more support in this room, both of our schools have the flexibility with their current staff to schedule it as such. Because in first grade you're dealing with a six-year-old. Yes, and learning to read and all, yes, absolutely. So that so that's why I was asking. No, great question. Yeah, I know. I, did or I mean conversely, so? you're dealing with an 11-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the important thing, um, every grade level poses this challenge, but certainly first grade, uh, yeah. when you're dealing with six-year-olds, yeah. um, that does pose significant challenges from tying shoes to opening Regulating milk cartons themselves. to, yeah. you know, you name it. But one of the things that I want to compliment uh, Jason and Brent in particular, um, El Sierra and, and Belair's principal, is just the work that they do with our uh, district office team to make sure, so when we're having these conversations, that's one of the things that we want to make sure that we cover is the entire day, talk to them about the support that they need, who could we utilize when, and make sure that that's available and then if there's a hole in that then that's where we put our heads together and see how we can make sure that we plug that hole I, I think it's important and Jane's done a nice job with this um, 31 kids in 2019 in a class looks a lot different than 31 kids when many of us went to school you know where, where you were in straight rows and, and the teacher was more of a lecture style approach um, that is not what first grade looks like many of us know that because we've had kids go through first grade so in many of these um, core content areas when you're talking about ELA or science or math having two adults in there those ratios come down to 1 to 15 very quickly if you've got students with special needs you'll have other adults in there as well but um, back to your original question Tracy one of the things that we want to make sure that we do is continue to meet with with Jason or Brent or any other principal um, in, in that has a class that's impacted like this and make sure that we have that coverage throughout the day um, so that they can always have that extra assistance with these classes thank you just real quick too I first of all um, I want to commend Brent and Jason for doing a good job communicating this up front. But the only thing I would say too is that um, for them to each work with the, the teachers that have these large classrooms, to have that continued kind of communication with parents because the number is shocking in a lot of ways because you're right, we associate it back to when we went to school. So I think making sure that we're, we are regularly communicating with what's going on in the classroom, how we're utilizing our resources and making sure that, that everybody's uh, child is getting uh, the right amount of attention I think is going to be critical in, in in keeping families happy and not not having people focus on the number that's on a piece of paper but on the experience the the student is getting as well absolutely that's a very good point yeah and the next slide is we're looking a little closer at our middle schools um, and and yes Herrick and O'Neill there is a wide range in the total enrollment with the 670 plus at Herrick and 441 what we really tried to accomplish this year was again bringing the average class size down or to have the range be more consistent between the two schools uh, and so you look we were we basically we transferred some staff from O'Neill to Herrick and added to some additional sections at Herrick in order to bring the class sizes down at Herrick um, but we'll want to continue to monitor that and and look at some of those pockets where we will be higher Math can be a little bit misleading because we have different math classes. So while the average looks, you know, 22 and 18, that's great. We really, in reality, may have a class of 27 and a class at 16, depending on the needs and what the course is in math. Um, but we are, we are proud of that much better balance than we've had in the past. So this slide shares then overall by grade level where we are in relation to the targets that Resources Review Council set last year. And you'll notice grades one and two um, did not meet the target overall. We do have some more work and some more conversations ahead. Um, and as I, as I mentioned as well, we need conversations as a district, community, administrative team for some, putting some systems and structures in place to and communicating them out that was definitely feedback we, we have received is typically the staffing was not as widely discussed in previous years it really was handled internally and and that's something that our community community is asking for is more conversation a better understanding as to how we're making the staffing decisions and one of the things that I know Jane uh, and the rest of the team and, and myself included feel very strongly about is coming back this time in year and showing 
people what these numbers are. And so we can we can put the sunshine on there. We can really have a good community conversation, not just now, but it, you know throughout the year about is this something we're comfortable with? Is this something we want to have bigger conversations about? I think it's very important that everyone in the community can see where our enrollment is and, and you know if there are differences. Again, because that really does help drive a lot of the conversations, especially as we get later on in, into facilities and other things like that. Sorry, Jane, I think I have a question. Oh, no, I, I, have a, I actually have a question back the other side. The disparity between this, Herrick and O'Neill. Okay, the middle with, of this slide. Yeah, back to middle school, the 233 student difference between the two schools. Do you have a projection, like is it is it gonna stay, is it look like it's gonna stay that way? Like that big of a difference between the two schools? Or is it just this year? It's not, that's, it's, it's a little lower. I wanna say it was maybe 460. But when we go, when you go back to, I don't wanna try to go back. I'm just wondering this if this is, is a common thing. This, like this is how we can look because we can look at the schools that would feed into O'Neill and Herrick. Uh -huh. And so our grade levels, we don't see a dip necessarily. Okay. That would mean that would go lower. Um, but I can trend out. I mean, I can actually get that information together, yeah, rolling have, these up and trend that out. Yeah, we have the district demographic data. I think one of the things that we'll always see is Herrick is just the way it's zoned right now because it has an extra elementary school feeding into it with Henry Puffer. Um, that is going to always cause Herrick to be bigger. Uh, what we see down the road, though, because you also have Lester feeding into Herrick, that those numbers would typically stay higher uh, on the north side than they would on the, the south side if everything uh, were to stay status quo. Gotcha. Thank you. The next few slides are informational, um, again, for our board, and this was shared actually last May as well. Um, just a number of our teachers, our vocal music PE, that the bottom three bullets, which is important to keep in mind as we're talking about what are our next steps with facilities. Um, Lester obviously has limited classroom spaces. We do have doubled up PE classes at Lester and at Kingsley at this point and some of our conversations uh, internally around that um, are really let's take a close look at Kingsley also there's the biliteracy program and the best program and as those programs continue to grow it, should we be making some adjustments I mean that's just conversations ahead um, because of the double up PE classes again we have two teachers and I think our staff's done a great job of organizing the instruction so it is safe and kids have get a quality learning experience. It, it is not ideal. Highland, you'll notice also we still, while we didn't hit the caps, if you remember we had the caps for the Highland enrollment, we did not hit a cap. However, Highland still is very tight with space and does not have a dedicated classroom for the art and music. So we need to keep that in mind, again, as we're looking forward. Related service staff, we added, this was um, a question that came up out of my, the May presentation, just an interest by our board of like how many, what's the FTE allocations across the district. In the, uh, the past year, we've increased psychologists, we've increased the nurse support in our schools. Um, I do wanna point out, if you look at the certified school nurse, uh, two weeks ago, we had scheduled four of 4.4 FTE, we did have a resignation. So that now is at a 3.4. While we've posted it, it's a very difficult position to fill and find a quality candidate for. However, Jessica has been working very, very hard with our administrators, with our um, nurses, to reorganize the registered nurses, the RNs. And so we, the, the plan would increase RN support to offset not being able to hire a certified school nurse at this point in the year. So the impact in our schools, we will still have a nurse in every school five days a week. So we are very proud of it. It's, it's a lot of work and it's a tough, been tough positions to fill. Um, but we've still, we think there's great progress there. Um, the information about our other district programs, again, just for our board and community's awareness. Our preschool is, we have talked about, has, has hit the target, that's, that's an easy, one because that's set by the grant. Um, so we are definitely, we do are starting with class sizes that are less than 15 students. Our biliteracy program continues to grow. This year it's now rolling up to sixth grade. So through the work with Justin and the biliteracy committee, 
And they'll really be talking about those next steps with my literacy program, what that would look like. I know the questions are out there. If we're at sixth grade this year, what does that mean for middle school? Um, that will really be discussed through the work of the, the committee this year. RISE and DLP, well, RISE really was a newer program, so that is now rolling up. So we'll have students from kindergarten through fourth grade in our RISE program. And then our DLP, our developmental learning program and BEST, were our, our, the programs that have been around longer in the district. So those are serving students K through eight. And then this slide, which is copied right from that May presentation, um, again, the bigger conversations that, that are ahead of us and really is, is talking more about looking at our model, looking at our class sizes and what we're trying to do with balance. With the neighborhood schools, we're going to probably have, if our current model, we don't change anything, we're going to have the wide range in our smaller schools that's going to happen where we have the situation of a 15 and a 30. Um, and so really, we want to start those conversations. I know our community members have asked some of these questions, or some of the board members have asked these questions, and really dig in this year and talk about, you know, is there going to be, are we going to add protocols? Are we going to to cap classes. We did at Highland, we haven't done that at any other school. Combination classes. Some years we've had them. This year you'll notice when the buildings work together, they've chosen to opt for the larger class size of 30 as opposed to a combination class and, and really feel they can better support kids with the 30 and the supports I had described earlier in the presentation. You know, should we be looking at all boundaries? and readjusting the question. Um, I know one of the suggestions that came through resources review was the two section elementary. Is, can we, is there a way we could look and try to adjust so that every elementary school has a minimum of two sections? And so these, these are questions that have been close to us um, that we will talk about. Our board is also, again, will talk about. Um, the 6-8 middle school structure and the, that possibility we all know is part of our conversations we're already having. And so that's at work to come. I don't know, Kevin, if you're... And just to, just to kind of summarize this last slide in particular, um, this is one that I, I was happy to see that was on uh, the spring edition of this presentation and now once again in the fall. And that's done very deliberately. As you look a little further down in the agenda this evening, you're going to see um, a, a recommendation to start engaging with a community uh, engagement consultant to really start to have uh, some good conversations around this. I, I always like to remind the community that just because you're asking these questions doesn't mean that any predeterminations have been made or anything like that, but you know, we really do have to start um, tackling some of these issues, and a lot of these issues, quite frankly, are facility related. You've got bigger schools, you've got smaller schools, you've got different attendance areas, and so um, we really do value the community input, um, and we want to hear from our community, and so there's going to be many opportunities uh, in the fall and beyond to start having these conversations, but again, I would like to just remind everyone, you know, at home and then here as well, that just having these questions is, is the responsible thing to do. It, it, it really is. It doesn't mean that the Board of Education or the administration has any agendas that, that are, are hidden or anything like that. We really do need to start answering uh, some of these questions because they will help guide our facility planning and things like that. So in order to really do this process, it's bringing in that outside person to help engage with uh, the community on various levels and to engage our staff. So our staff can also weigh in and give their opinion on the direction and the future of the district. So again, very excited to start having these uh, conversations. I think as Jill said at the last meeting, a uh, little nervous about having some of these conversations, but um, they're important questions to ask. And, and we do the same thing at home when we're making big decisions. We weigh the pros and cons of everything, and then we take all the information and we make a decision moving forward. That's what we're really gonna start doing um, you know, this fall and beyond as a community. So again, Jane, thank you for your, your presentation, and I thought you did a really nice job of laying everything out. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions or at this no. point? No, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to make a, a comment. I, 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 you know, thanks, Jane. I think you, you know, we've had some discussions on this, and I, I think you've thought of everything. Um, so I, I think that's great that we have this discussion. But I think as we look at those smaller schools and the, the neighborhood school model, I think it's an interesting dynamic because we're saying we have too few kids in the school, but then too many kids in the class. I, I think we need to um, reflect on that for a bit because where's that, where's that balance? Where do we kind of find... What, what makes a building tick. And I, I think we need to have those difficult conversations because 
um, you know, we're, we're really challenging our, our principals of those smaller buildings to make things work with, uh, without kind of having the, the two sections or the three sections. And I think those Kingsley's and Lester's um, that have a lot of enrollment have, have much more flexibility. So um, equity is a, a tricky subject and, and how do we make sure that we have those conversations. So I'm, I'm really interested in engaging the third party, but I think we could be a little bit more proactive um, with, within this table to kind of drive some of these discussions in parallel with, with our third party consultant. So I'm excited. Uh, my comment had to do with Highland, and I was just um, reflecting this as I was looking at this, um, this presentation and maybe feeling a sense of relief that the average class size at Highland is is not it's not it's not at the top it's it's I think it, there's four at least four buildings that have a higher average class size than Highland um, I know of the six of us who are here tonight only Darren and I were involved in that decision a couple years ago to cap the classes at Highland and I want to just remind um, my fellow board members that that was a two-year decision and so this would be year two of that decision so we still need to um, and, and a little bit more context in January Darren and I went to um, what do we call those two uh, PTA meeting PTA meetings where you send two board members yeah. to meet with um, uh, yeah it's a PTA meeting no, I, I thought we had a special name for it but, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I was thinking the two by two but that's not that's it's not, else. not yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and we heard very clearly from the Highland PTA that this is something that they want the board focused on and we, we committed to them that we're going to be um, sincerely um, following this and and considering ideas and proposals to to make sure that we have a plan for Highland in the future to um, to secure an equitable education for all those children. So um, that's just one thing as as the year unfolds that um, I want to make sure that the board is is focusing on. Yeah, no matter what the speed is regarding the master's facility plan, that obviously is going to we know is. Um, has been right there on the on the border so we know we got to pay close attention to it so we will we're watching it and I know, I know that you guys are but it's something that I know that we'll want to make sure we have several conversations about so we can be open with the community and what's happening there and I know that the other piece is when we go out and we engage with the community we'll sort of be able to define where some of our what our community is open to and what kind of options we have to play around with to, to do exactly what you're talking yeah, about, create I'm, that all, equity. All I'm and, saying there is yeah. I, I think we could um, prep those conversations on our end instead of wait for them to come back with specific recommendations based on that engagement. I, I think we could add to that dialogue ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, uh, you know, Steve, to your point, and I appreciate you making it, I, I think there are some times where we can definitely walk and chew gum at, at the same time. Um, there are some bigger facility questions, uh, but there are also some other things that we could, you know, the Highland example is a good one where you can bring other things to the board throughout the school year. I think one of the things is we talk about um, any kind of enrollment projections and things like that. We have to keep in mind staffing deadlines as we go into the school year and into next school year and things like that. It's almost hard to believe before we start even planning for this school year, we're already talking about deadlines for, for next school year, but um, the nature of the school calendar and things like that. So we can certainly have these conversations to determine um, what steps, if any, could we take you know, this year for the, for the following year. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are three communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, oh, yeah, there are. There are six communications actually on here. Are there any else? Any, anything else that anyone would like to include? Okay. Then on to uh, reports to the board. And we'll go ahead and start with the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. Again, very hard to believe uh, that we're almost halfway through August here and, and starting to talk about the 2019-20 school year, but it is definitely something that we are super excited for, and I want to commend our entire administrative team for the hard work they've done prepping for the school year. I also want to thank our teachers and our support staff. Um, if you go into all of our schools, it almost looks like school is ready to open tomorrow. We have teachers constantly coming in, prepping these buildings, and our maintenance and custodial crew have done just a fantastic job. So I do want to take this opportunity to publicly recognize all of them for their hard work in, in what takes place in, in a building over the summer is just truly amazing. And uh, our schools are ready to go, and uh, we're, we're excited to have the kids back. 
In terms of curriculum and instruction, the district uh, is very pleased to report the new science curriculum will be implemented this school year, and teachers will continue to receive training at all levels to support the initiative. In addition, the district will take the next step toward adopting a new math curriculum by piloting materials across all grade levels. Should there be any questions about either of those initiatives, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, Mr. Sissel or Dr. Eichmiller. They have a really good plan in place uh, for science, the first year of implementation, then uh, our next step in the journey for uh, renewing the math uh, curriculum. So kudos to both of them for a great job. Finance, at the next board meeting in September, the Board of Education will be asked to approve the budget for fiscal year 20. The administration fully intends to present a balanced budget. However, please know the budget is extremely tight and future budgets may not be balanced without changes to current revenues and expenditures. I, I think as we look at that every year, we know that it's getting tighter. I want to, uh, again, thank Todd and Katie for all their hard work putting those budgets together. Later this evening, in terms of facilities, the board will continue its discussion on the draft master facility plan, along with third-party community engagement specialists. These items will once again be discussed as part of the district's work stemming from the strategic planning process. In terms of public relations, the district's annual report will be sent out to all District 58 addresses this week, so we're excited about that. We have a new report format, uh, a lot more color this year, and a lot more pictures, and, and so we're very happy. I know Megan has uh, been working extremely hard over that, and, and so Megan, thank you for your efforts on that. She's also been uh, hard at work finishing both the English and the uh, Spanish version of our handbooks, and so those will be coming out at the start of the school year as well, but we're certainly excited about the new format for the annual report. Uh, personnel, obviously, we just heard a detailed report uh, from Jane uh, on personnel. I, I really want to thank all of our admin team. You, you heard the talk of a last minute resignation in, in classes may, potentially splitting and all of those things. It, it's kind of once you get everything finalized, it's never finalized because something else comes up. And, and so the amount of work that takes place in the personnel office this time of year is um, it's simply amazing. So uh, Jane's got a great team and our, our building leaders and, and district office staff really do a nice job. Uh, just a couple of others tonight. Several district level committees and councils and board committees have started or will start in the near future. Committees and councils um, are, include things like the Superintendent's Advisory Council, um, Facilities, Financial Advisory Committee, District Leadership Team, Policy Committee, and the Legislative Committee. Input and feedback are the cornerstones of a healthy and strong school district. So if there's any members of the public or staff members who would like to participate in these committees, please contact myself or Melissa at the district office and, and we'll put you on uh, one of those committees because volunteers are, are, are needed for many of those and so we appreciate that. I do want to take a moment to address the letter uh, that was sent out by District 58 on Friday regarding the Pearson data breach. And I use that very deliberately because I think some news outlets reported it as a District 58 uh, data breach and that was not the case. Last week, several local school districts were notified by Pearson via the U.S. mail that student data from AmesWeb, which is an elementary reading assessment, was breached. District 58 did not receive written notice, but we inquired with the company to determine if we were also part of the breach. We saw that several neighboring school districts were putting out notices and we wanted to double check. And so Dr. Ike Miller did contact Ames Web. It, it took them a, a significant time to get back to us, a, a, about a day and a half in today's technology age. I call that uh, significant. And unfortunately, uh, we learned uh, via a help desk ticket that we were also part of the breach. Families were immediately notified and Pearson has offered to assist impacted families with free credit monitoring. If families are interested in the service, they can refer to the letter that was sent out uh, Friday and posted uh, on the district's website for directions. Pearson has stated that the last names and first names of students along with their birthdays were impacted. We did have a couple of people inquire why was that information shared on this particular assessment, you need the student's first and last name and then their date of birth to determine norms and, and other things, that, uh, reading levels and stuff like that. Um, staff emails may have also been out. Um, no other information we believe was compromised. Uh, again, we're going to be working closely with Pearson to figure out what went wrong, like uh, 13,000 other school districts across the United States. Um, while I'm pleased that no other personal information was out there. I know this can be a scary thing. I, too, as a parent, received that notice about all seven of my children's data being breached, and although it was their first and last names, uh, that is something that alarms all of us in 2019, and it should. And so we're uh, looking forward to learning more about the steps Pearson is going to take. Uh, keep in mind, Pearson is a company that is also um, hired by the state of Illinois 
to do our annual assessment, or they have been in the past. And so this is definitely something that um, Dr. Ike Miller is on top of, and will continue to work with neighboring districts to learn more about this, uh, because we want our parents to know that District 58 takes their student information extremely serious. Confidentiality is something that's very important to us, and uh, we are not pleased with Pearson's performance, and we will continue to work with other districts to make sure that we hold Pearson accountable. Again, though, if parents um, want more information, please contact our technology department, and we'll be happy to work with any of them. Just some upcoming events. Again, this week, we have new teachers. Uh, it's been a, a, a very exciting week um, to see all of our new teachers come in and just that excitement. We got a first chance to meet with them this morning. Uh, our, our team at the uh, ASC has done a great job preparing for that. Our opening institute days are next Monday and Tuesday for certified staff. And the first day of school, the big day, is August 22nd, so it's coming. And uh, Labor Day is September 2nd, so that will be the first day off we give to our kiddos. Uh, but that's coming up, and again, we couldn't be more excited and thrilled to have our students back uh, for the upcoming school year. And that concludes my superintendent's report. Thank you. Any questions? Fantastic. All right, with that, then we're going to move on to monthly business. Uh, with Mr. Trefoth. Good evening. So you have in your um, report, your packet this evening, two months of year-to-date report, the June 30th report on a cash basis and, and the July report. Uh, as we talked about earlier, at our, uh, last month, you know, the year ended for June 30th uh, in a positive position on a cash basis. Um, we have, do an audit annually, and that audit is on a modified accrual. So that will, those, those numbers will adjust when that piece comes out. However, those two will also end up in a positive position uh, due to the early tax structure and, and so forth and the way that revenue came in the last couple of fiscal years. Um, so that is helpful for us in, in knowing how we ended up um, against budget um, with expense and revenue for, for 630. And you have a new report then for 730 um, and also we've included uh, last year where we've had a three-year average as to what the last three years we're just going to add last year's in there as well so you'll have a four-year trend and where we're at to budget uh, comparison to that as we go forward um, other than that uh, you have you know this is the time that we have funds rolling in uh, and cash on hand um, as the property taxes are becoming available we did um, received notice from the state uh, of our general of our state aid our evidence-based funding uh, amount and that is up fifty or sixty thousand dollars above our projection so we'll be making that adjustment on the budget piece so you'll see that that adjustment uh, which we're good to you know happy to know that we were conservative in our estimate and that we will receive some more than what we what we initially early planned um, Though we have not seen, one of the things you'll see is on the state rep on your year-to-date report. There's no state report yet. Uh, that's just because there's no money. No money comes in from the state in July, um, in part because they paid all of last year's in the last fiscal year. Uh, the, they they issued four payments to the district. So, in years past, we've seen some money that would have come in June, May, or June, come in July this year. Uh, those those funds actually came to us in May. Um, also, you have on an action item um, a item from the Wellness Health and Wellness Committee uh, for Lavango. This is something the Health and Wellness Committee has been meeting over the summer. Um, we've been looking at uh, some different options as to how to help people manage um, care, and Lavango is a uh, a company that uh, it. It's a complete voluntary thing for individuals that are in our plan to choose. Um, they will get a notice through our, our systems if they are in, you know, covered into this area. And if they do so, they go into this format. They receive all of their uh, kits, their diabetes uh, items, their strips and test strips and, and, and equipment from Lavango. And then Lavango assists them with making sure they're man, you know, maintaining their their form and their care uh, as prescribed by the doctor. Um, and it also has, you know, if, if they report out of range, Lavango may go and check on them and make sure everything's okay. They have a 24-hour um, health 
consultant uh, and aid, you know, if they got yeah, by a 24-hour phone line to call uh, in the event that they need them. Um, and, and the goal is from an insurance, from, from a wellness plan perspective is continual proper care of, of that disease will, one, enable the person to, you know, have a healthier life, but also then reduce uh, expenses. And uh, we did this after uh, the research and the data showed that there's an estimate of about $30,000 or so of uh, expenses that could be, could have been avoided had people been on that, you know, on, on a continual care piece. Now, take those a bit with a grain of salt, but obviously, you know, there's some issues there. There's some numbers there that, you know, show that there may be some benefit to this type of system. So, uh, so that is in there that the committee has recommended. Um, I've also had a, a FAC meeting and a wellness and health committee. I don't want to take away your reports. Um, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've, we've gone through and, and, and updated the FAC uh, and had a conversation with uh, looking at a different firm for doing some investments that may uh, help our investment uh, interest income, uh, as well as looking at uh, some year-to-date reports. And, and your next year-to-date report will include a uh, detail and a, a review of the health and wellness uh, fund, where it is currently, and then where it's been previously the last couple of years. So with that, if there's any questions. I think we're in great shape. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks. All right, with that, we'll go on to our committees. Uh, the policy committee did not meet in July, neither did the legislative committee. Though, as you just heard, the financial advisory committee did. Um, I'll go ahead and give kind of a brief update. If you, and Steve, if you have anything to add, feel free as well. Um, we did just do a, we always do a quick uh, review, kind of to start off of exactly what we looked at today. Just make sure that uh, we don't have any questions about the, the report that's going to be coming through and just looking at our year to date. Uh, we spent a little bit of time, and I know that uh, um, Greg will go into a little bit more great detail on the on all the medical expenses and, and things along those lines, but we, we really took a look at uh, how we're moving today in, in the new way that we're managing money, where we're measuring more from uh, funds that come in per account to funds out as opposed to our MRF, and sort of comparing that to the medical reserve fund in the past, it was really more about how much money do we have in that account and does it meet the, the thresholds that we should be at that we're comfortable at uh, funding level and should we be transferring money in or out of that. Um, when we renegotiated our contracts and got everybody on the sort of on, on the same plans, what we did was we moved into a true rate structure that's measured based on our expenses um, and the current money that we have on hand. So we just spent a little bit of time and, and walked through that um, and then we spent time on the new investment options and, and anyone who knows about public organizations, we don't have a lot of options when it comes to making investments. We can't just go, you know, I got a really good feeling about this Facebook. We're going to just put all our money in there and see how it, how it works out. No, we have to be a little bit more protective of our funds. So uh, we were just taking a look at, at, at another organization that has a little bit more options for us to have a little bit more flexibility, more fund options where we can make money while it still um, meets a safety rating that, that makes sense for, for a public organization like ours. Uh, we attempted to have a little bit of a conversation on the future of the master's facility plan. We, we cut a little bit short because we ran a little bit long, but we did have an opportunity to discuss it a little bit and really kind of talk about um, that, yes, uh, the central administration is going to have to be part of this as well, and there's going to be a couple of different options that go along with it. And one of the key components, I think that there's a, a pretty solid understanding that Longfellow really does not make sense for us as a property. and um, and offsetting that is going to, offloading that is going to be something that we probably really, really need to seriously consider. Obviously, that takes a super majority of the board, but would be something that probably at some point will come up as a recommendation. But where do we, where do we move those administrators, and how do we keep our administrators together? And so some of that really is going to come as we continue to do analysis and we meet with the community and find out what options people are looking to take there and what option then would make the most amount of sense. Do we reutilize space that we have somewhere else? Do we build a new property on land that we already have? Do we find land? Do we lease something? So we'll be having more conversations on costs and stuff around that, I think, in upcoming meetings. But um, 
but just to let you know those conversations are still happening, uh, even though I, I know that wasn't a focus of anything that we had in, in the last board meeting. So, anything I missed? Oh, that was, that was good. Okay. Any questions? All right. Well, with that then, uh, the district leadership team did not meet in July. So with that, we're going to go on to the Health and Wellness Committee with uh, Greg Harris. All right. Thanks, Darren. Uh, so this is the first time that the Health and Wellness Committee is having its own agenda item. Um, so I, I am pleased to report as the um, board's liaison to that committee, just to remind you all this is not one of the board's committees. This is a uh, committee that um, Todd and Jane are on. There, there's also representation from other um, employee groups. There's a building principal. Then there are representatives from all the collective bargaining units. Um, I don't vote. Uh, I'm just reporting here as, as your eyes and ears on that committee. Um, we have been meeting throughout the summer a couple times. Um, one of the things we're looking at is we're actively looking for ways to reduce costs in the short and the long term. You'll recall that we are self-funded in our insurance plan, so that's, that's really important to us. Todd just spoke to us about Livongo, and then we'll be able to vote on that later. Um, we also look at claims data. I'm, I'm pleased to report that we had our lowest July in two years, um, coming in at $330,000 in paid claims. That is. Um, really, really nicely compared to um, 18 when we, uh, 2018 when we spent, when we spent 878000 and 2017 when we spent 539000 So we are, knock on wood, in a pretty um, good streak of having two consecutive months um, in a reprieve from very, very high claims. So we're, I guess we're all should be hoping that that just continues on. Also, we, um, I, I can share with you that um, we looked at uh, ER visit data from January to May, and we compare that to the same time frame in 2018, and we are um, definitely saving some money there, um, about $26,000 in savings, and that's probably due to a $200 copay that was instituted on Jan 1 at, as per the, uh, the new collective bargaining agreement. Finally, just to remind the board that um, you'll recall from our June board meeting that we voted to increase premiums by 9.9% effective July 1. That was the first step in a two-step process. We will be um, coming with another recommendation to the board in October to um, uh, have another premium increase effective January 1st of 2020. And the reason we are doing that is because we want to have premium increases um, aligned with when staff members um, are allowed to make plan adjustments based on open enrollment. Um, Anything else, Todd, that you can think of? I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. We have a, just looking at the attachment, there's a significant uh, skew towards our, our, our deficit on the universal PPO plan is in the couple hundred thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. whereas every other plan is either in the surplus or, in essence, break even. Correct. Um, one, one thing just, I mean, all things being equal, one thing just to, to remind the board is all of our top claimants who are costing the district in, um, at least $130,000 are they're all in the, the PPO plan. So that is one thing that's going to drive that. And it's also where just a majority of our, of our um, staff tend to be. The, yeah, and to add to that, I mean, uh, um, and part of that we'll be looking at when the committee makes a recommendation coming to the board. Um, one plan, the high deductible plan, which is a, a kind of catastrophic bronze, they call it bronze level plan for Affordable Care Act. Um, that has very little utilization uh, and that will probably have a zero. I, mean, I can pretty much say that you know, the committee isn't looking at increasing that because they're does seem to be a reason, yeah, that, that the claim, that the revenue exceeds claims, so that's not an issue. The high, the HSA claim and the high deductible with the HSA uh, is a fairly new, has not been, and we're looking at six months data at this point. Um, so that may be, at least for the next year, coupled in with whatever increase, looking at, you know, the, the those other three plans, the universal, which there are, uh, trying to find if there's a membership on these reports that you have. But that is the majority of where our membership is, is in the universal PPO plan. The reduced PPO plan has, uh, I think, 20-some members or so, 
as does the HSA. Um, so now these are before the 9.9 percent increase, you know, that took effect July 1st. Um, teachers don't get their initial paycheck until for this year, until August 30th. So their paychecks that have gone that run out um, in Ju in July and August from the prior year are all on that older rate. Um, so we aren't seeing that revenue stream coming in from that adjustment as well. So we take all of those into account when the projection, when, when we make that recommendation coming to the board, um, you know, in the next month or so. But yes, there is, there is a significant impact um, by that, that PPO plan, um, you know, overall uh, because of, of those, um, not just the high claimants, but the overall plan structure. And Todd, correct me if I'm not, um, saying this correctly, but our, our consultant who we're working with on the Health and Wellness Committee has made the recommendation that instead of being, you know, three and a half percent to the red, that uh, when we're thinking about setting rates for next year, we should probably, in order to be fiscally responsive, responsible, should be projecting to be somewhere between two and a half percent and five percent um, over budget. Is that yeah, we, yeah, well, we'll need we, to, we're... <laughs> There, there are a couple of things. One, we'll be, we'll be making a recommendation to you in October. That will set the rate for January 1st, and that'll be for the next 12 months. So there's obviously a piece of where we're at and what the medical inflation is, you know, is projecting out for the next 12 months, um, as well as um, you know, what we've consumed in the last fiscal year, just you know, in the last calendar year. Um, and how much of that is, you know, that we need to, to increase to help and adjust for. Um, so, you know, it, it, it looking, I think we, we talked about in the committee, if we pulled the trigger today, it would be somewhere around between four and a half to six percent or six and a half, depending on, on some of those parameters, which is we get another month of claims in, so that helps us. Uh, having two months in a row that were lower helps us a lot as well, um, in, you know, from the previous year. So, you know, we'll get a little, little more finer tuning in it between now and October as to what that's going to be. But it, it, it's probably somewhere in that ballpark on, you know, on top of the 9.9 .9 that was on July 1st. And I also just, as a side note to the board, um, you know, budget projections have based on some of these assumptions. So we're in our ball, yeah, we're, none of these look at this point to have an issue for our budget as what we've projected to date. Any other questions? All right, thank you, thank you both of you. All right. With that, we got one uh, discussion item tonight and that's uh, kind of updating and kind of discussing the facility planning update and uh, the third party uh, consultant. Uh, we went ahead there, it, we went ahead and posted publicly the presentation um, that we had from White and Company into uh, the board docs for anybody that wants to take a look at it, uh, including anybody up here. And with that, uh, I'm assuming Dr. Russell wants to kick us off with some recommendations on the third party consultant. Thanks. When, when I took the school district over, actually, full disclosure, when I was applying for this job, I, I saw this big strategic plan and I thought, how in the world am I ever going to get my arms around this thing? Well, I'm happy to report to the community that I think I, I spent a great deal of every evening getting my arms around that plan now. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to talk about it uh, this evening. Uh, to put it in context for our members of the audience, in, in 2012, uh, the district really started to take a look at, at the facilities in the district, realizing that while we have great facilities that are very well maintained, they're aging facilities. And we really needed to take a look at those to start to determine long term what we were going to do. Not uncommon from what you would see in places like District 99 or other neighboring districts. Uh, 2018, the district got together to write a strategic plan, and facilities was a major component of that. So was communications, and so was curricular work. And this past summer, the uh, strategic plan really called for a few things to take place in terms of action steps on that strategic plan. And I'd like to uh, welcome Brad and Amy from White & Company, our district's architect. Uh, not only are they our architect, but they've also been helping us through this process, including a, a detailed presentation uh, that was called for in the strategic plan um, last month for July about a draft master facility plan. And I, and I can't emphasize that word draft 
enough. You see the word potential a lot in there as well because that's what it is right now. You've got a draft plan with a lot of potential things you could do, but as several members of the audience pointed out, um, it's not an all-encompassing document and there are several questions that still need to be asked and, and they're legitimate questions to ask from everything from what are you going to do to the administrative center or, or you know, do you really want to do this work at, at the middle schools? All those different things that, that have been brought up. And so one of the conversations that we had at Great Link last meeting was to start to think about third party uh, engagement specialists who can come in and really talk to our community about those different options and to generate even more options. And um, so we were tasked as an admin team to look at the different viable options that were out there and then to bring a recommendation for a third party to come back and start that process. And I'm pleased to say you'll see an action item uh, a little further down on the agenda that is going to have a recommendation for the Board of Education. And the recommendation that we are going to make is that we um, start to engage in a contract with Paul Hanley and to have Paul Hanley come back to the Board of Education at our next meeting in September. So before this work officially kicks off in the district, the Board of Education would get a chance to speak with Paul and make sure that you're comfortable with Paul's plan of action prior to him uh, starting. Now that name, Paul Hanley, will sound familiar. Uh, that is the exact same uh, individual who worked very closely with District 99. Um, now we had several good responses to our uh, request uh, for qualifications. And um, there were several that were very close to Paul as well. At the end, what we really liked about Paul in particular was his knowledge of Downers Grove and his knowledge particularly with District 58 because the work that he did with District 99 um, looked at breaking up 99's feeder districts and, and specifically they looked at District 58 residents and they would look at uh, District uh, 68 residents in Woodridge. So um, while many of these um, people who responded or groups that responded to our uh, RFQ certainly were qualified and, and they really did give us good plans, um, at the end of the day we just felt like Paul was the best fit when we took into consideration, especially that Downers Grove piece in the institutional knowledge that he already had of our district and of our uh, community. So two things, um, later on in the agenda, the board is going to be asked to uh, direct the superintendent and the administrative team to uh, negotiate a proposal or a contract with Paul. Right now we have a proposal and we wanna make sure that we get everything lined up. And then um, the second thing that I wanna discuss is, um, and I, I wanna thank Amy, I see her here, we had a big number in that draft um, plan that was put out last time. And several members had asked, what's behind that number? Where, where did they get the dollar amount? And while this document um, isn't all encompassing, it does a really nice job of laying out exactly under this draft plan what some of these potential items would cost. It addresses things like options for the administrative center on top of all the 13 schools or in addition to the 13 schools. It also um, will talk about things like electric or electricity and plumbing and HVAC and, and all those different things that really provides more background. Um, it is a very thorough document. It's out there for, for public review. The one word of caution I would give to the public and to the school board in general is when you're looking at this, this is kind of our, our next starting point or, or, or the next um, piece of the puzzle, so to speak, but it is not a final plan. It is a plan to start conversations and to engage our community. And what we're hoping as an administrative team is now that we have the draft master facility plan that was called for in July, we've got the backup documentation to show where those numbers came from. The August meeting was supposed to really um, have the board vote on a final plan. Well, I, I think what we all realized was we need a lot more input from our community before we get to that final plan. So what we're asking the board is not to vote on a final plan uh, tonight for obvious reasons. We're asking the board to allow the administration to engage with Paul Hanley in the contract process so Paul can come in and, and work with our community. In terms of where are you at in the timeline of the strategic plan, the strategic plan calls for the board um, to make a decision in December about whether or not they want to move forward. Well, with Paul's work, you may be there in December, you may not be. Um, that's what the community engagement process is all about. You've got this draft plan now and it's time to start um, really filtering that plan down 
to feel or to figure out where are our priorities as a school district uh, we've talked about this several times in, in committees and in here in the board you know again I'll, I'll use that analogy when we look at our own homes many of us had plans that you know what if we added an addition or if we did this and then all of a sudden the contractor comes back and they say okay here's what it's going to cost and you kind of scratch your head and go okay well let's talk about this what if we trim back this what if we really need to this and, and you start to boil down the essentials but you get there through good communication good input from all stakeholders and that's what we're asking our community to do and it is very helpful to have somebody with expertise in that area whether it's through polling or surveys or just knowing how to how to work a room and, and to really ask those important questions so what I anticipate this fall would look like is um, if the board uh, allows us to engage with Paul as Paul would come back and, and start to really define what that could look like at the September meeting if the board likes what it hears it would finalize that in the form of a vote and we would start that community engagement process and we would start um, through the work of a, a citizens task force which would be the next evolution of our facilities council you would start that work and, and you would start to hash out a lot of these questions and then to come back to the board of education with different options and say here's what we're hearing from our community here's what we think moving forward makes sense here's option one two three four and, and, and who knows what where those options will be I think it's important that we engage with the community and then continue to loop the board back in so that's where we're at um, again I want to thank all of the companies that provided us with proposals I want to thank white and company for the the backup documentation and with that I can turn it over to the school board for um, questions on where we're at in the process questions I know you've been on information overload with this too, so it's okay if, so, if we're. So September, so tonight we're, we're, we're deciding to vote on the firm, and September he would, if we choose to vote for him, then he would come back in September, and we could, we could talk about all the things we want them to go and look into? Correct, because right now what you have is you've got a proposal, and a proposal's not the same as a contract, so you want to make sure that we get you know all the fine details in a contract, but prior to the board fully committing to that, you would have a chance to have that individual here at the board meeting, ask them questions and kind of reshape you know the direction that you would like that to go, because a proposal is written with the district in mind, but sometimes it's more generically speaking, and it would give Paul a chance to talk about flexibility and, and really make sure that the board's comfortable about his um, tentative plan moving forward. So when you're talking about being a homeowner or whatever, now that we see the price tag for like an addition on Herrick and O'Neill, this would be the this would be the task of the consultant to be like, so are you? So now that you see the number, that are you still interested in middle school, sixth yeah, middle schools I, like that? I think that's a, a great way of putting it. I, I think, you know, if you look at what District 99 did with, with a lot of Paul's work, he's going to frame things like, are you comfortable with the status quo exactly as it is? Or right. how would you feel if we did incorporate sixth graders into the middle school or, or you know, boundaries or, or whatever the case may be, asking those questions and then getting that feedback and coming back to the Board of Education saying, you know, option one, you have this much support around this moving forward or option two the community really feels strongly about this and you've got much more support for option two or option three and then those different options are those various questions that we would ask many of which you saw on Jane's slide earlier and that would be incorporating like and they would be using the work that white and company's already done and and that your administrative team that's exactly so, correct so, so this is this is how much it'll cost so what do you, how, how do you feel they basically taking a temperature of everyone's opinion on their threshold that is that is correct that that is a big piece of the work I would also say that another piece of the work is, is comprehensive is the work that white has done with our draft master facility plan and what you would see in some of this backup documentation there could be other questions that are out there with the community that the community says hey we know you put these three or four things in here we also want you to look at this or why haven't you looked at that and those are questions then too that we could come back with different price options and what that may look like this is a pretty good starting point but it is a draft and there could be other questions that we need to um, examine as well uh, from our community. Okay. I also want to just um, really highlight the partnership that we have with our high school district. I can't tell you 
how beneficial uh, Dr. Thiele and his entire staff have been with us as we go through this. Um, we're certainly very grateful in District 58 to have a partner right across the street in District 99. It just makes so much sense that the more we can work together, the more we should do it. We've always done that as a district, and I just want to highlight again um, that cooperation between District 99. We're certainly grateful uh, to have all of their insight, especially because they're fresh off this process that they themselves just went through uh, for the last several years. But again, I, I, I will state that doesn't mean that District 58 just does everything that the high school did because we are a much different district and we have different uh, kiddos and, and, and you know you, you can't really, sometimes it is apples to oranges, but having somebody who's gone through this, it, it's really invaluable to, to talk with them and, and really bounce ideas off of them. So when we look at the total price tag mm -hmm. of the $244.8 million, and it's broken down very neatly into four categories, maintenance, self and hate health, safe and healthy environments, 21st century learning, and great reconfiguration. Um, I guess I never asked this question before. Um, are we including the Longfellow conversation in any possible, um, you know, in here there's a section about um, possibly building um, a, 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 a new ASC, next existing ASC. Would that, um, the, the cost of those products be lumped into the maintenance? Portion and would the are, are we making sure that we're going to be hearing from the community on on that piece as well specifically? So that's a that's a perfect example of why this draft master facility plan has a lot in it. It doesn't necessarily encompass either revenue you could potentially get or expenditures you can get from a new administrative center. That being said, though, we knew that that was very important, and so in the back you would see an addendum, which really covers the cost of potentially renovating an ASC site or leasing an ASC site or, or starting over with a, with a you know a brand new ASC site. Um, so that's an example though of how these numbers can shift both up and down as, as you go through the process. So in the original draft master facility plan, while we mentioned Longfellow, it really didn't take into consideration Longfellow or the existing building on 63rd. However, we know that that is something that's going to come up. And so that's another example back to uh, what I was just highlighting with Tracy. Other questions are going to come up through this process that will then be folded into various options that you would have. So what I do anticipate is that somewhere along the way you would see that administrative conversation get lumped into these categories as well, whether you're talking about maintenance or safe, safe and healthy environments as well. I just want to make sure that we have the community's pulse on that issue specifically mm -hmm. um, because I, I, as I understand talking to former board members, um, it, it, you know, Doug and, and John always wanted to remind us last year that you know we put a 10-year roof on the on the Longfellows, and then and then the clock is ticking. Um, but when they tried to unload it several several boards ago, people got cold feet because the community felt pretty strongly about it. So I just want to make sure that we are are very um, earnestly engaged with the community about that, and mm -hmm. and get really good feedback to um, guide the board's um, decision on that. Uh, so, Greg, I want to thank you for. What you're just highlighting is the importance of community engagement and community feedback, but doing it in the proper manner that doesn't send alarm bells up and doesn't cause you know 500 people to storm a, storm a board meeting. I, I think the, the trick here is to make sure that our community understands how much we value their input and feedback, and we want that in the decision making process. But simply asking the question by no means you know, should anyone interpret it as, well, they've already decided what we're going to do for X, Y, or Z. We're really trying to gather all that input because you never know what will be the hot button issue or what won't. But I can guarantee you as you go through a process and you start asking questions during this process, you will step on some of those hot button issues. And, and that's not our intention to rile up the community. But, you know, if we put this in the context of taxpayers, one of the things that um, we are entrusted a lot with is the um, taxpayer money in, in how we examined every possible avenue. We might not go in those directions, but have we really examined all those different possibilities the same way we would do with our own homes? Um, are we doing that as well with, with the school district? So certainly Longfellow will be a piece of this uh, conversation. Uh, depending on where that goes, uh, there will be as much as possible in public, but then obviously you know, there, there could be some in closed session too if you're talking about real estate and some of those other things. I think it's really important in the fact that a lot of times we're going to be asking questions that we don't necessarily even think it's a great idea, but it's, but it's an important question to ask just to understand where everyone uh, is coming from. We heard in our strategic planning process by PMA that 
people really wanted to, to keep the um, small neighborhood schools and they wanted to have maybe sixth grade be moved and, and these different things and now there's actual numbers that go along with it and we heard people not liking the idea of grade level centers and not like just because we asked those questions again it's now with more information do you still feel the same way and yeah and I, I can't reiterate enough like when I talk to people just because we ask a question or just because we even discuss it up here on the dais does not mean any of us are actually advocating for it it's just as we go through this process we want to make sure um, we're incredibly thorough and I think that's in the other part with the Longfellow is I think it's important to really communicate to the to the community at large that that property is not serving us well and is a very expensive property for us to maintain and um, and, it's, and to let people know that as we go through the process that it, this is not some afterthought like oh let's just get rid you know somebody's interested in buying the land so let's get rid of it um, it, this has been something that's been going on and discussed for for decades and um, as we're looking at everything now and with we have such an important need um, for our administrators to be able to work closely together and having them separated is, is, is never been the best solution either so we have to be open to to a lot of these ideas um, and, and understanding but I said this I think last month but I've said I've said it to people when I talk to them individually like Everything sounds like a great idea until you see what it costs. And so it's a really important now to, to go back to the community and say, hey, now with these numbers, how do we feel? Where are your priorities? Do you prioritize them in the exact same way? Because if we do, then, then we're going to have to have some, some big conversations. If we don't, then we need to start engaging with White and, and talking about, all right, what does it mean if we shift you know, this thing around and do this differently and, and, and look at different numbers then? And, and the, the other reminder I would give is, as you look across Downers Grove, there's been several conversations over the last 50, 60 years, whether it's with District 99 or with District 58. Um, you know, uh, at one point, Longfellow was a school in our, in our district, and, and they had to have a tough conversation about shifting the kids over to Pierce Downer a, a, at a certain time. And, uh, you know, at, at one point, District 99 debated very strongly in the late 90s, should we build a third high school in Woodridge? And, and instead, you saw the additions coming uh, on Downers North and, and Downers South. And so you, you also, for those of you who have been to Downers Grove in a long time, or for a long time, you know, Washington School, which is now a park, was, was, was once a school. And so we have had many conversations throughout, um, you know, the, the community over the years. And we have some unique situations taking place right now in our district. When you look at Hillcrest, that's a school that splits. Um, some kids go to Herrick, some kids go to O'Neill. So a lot of these things, whether they become very local, um, one of the things I would remind everyone is, is that we have tackled difficult subjects in, or, or uh, topics in our community, um, but we have to do it in a way that really values everyone's input and make sure that we're doing it in, in uh, the, the most transparent way as, as, as possible. But I, I know our community is, is up for um, having these, these conversations, but again, to emphasize Darren's point, um, no decisions have been made. Um, this is a genuine process where we're really interested in, and we need the feedback from our community and from our staff about the direction of our facilities moving forward. Any other questions or, or statements? Just one other quick question, just um, going back to the third party consultant. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin, is it your understanding that I know you talked a little bit about um, Paul's firm being flexible? Just as I looked through the various proposals, there were I was very impressed with his firm, but I, there were a couple other like key things in the field where I was like, oh, I really like this one small piece from another proposal. Are, are they going to be open or flexible to kind of taking little pieces here that we might say like, oh, one thing that really stood out, you know, they, this one talked about having multiple options and coming back and forth with the different community mm -hmm. engagement pieces, or is there flexibility in there to kind of bring to Paul's firm some suggestions and ideas and things that we feel really strongly about and they will be willing to incorporate? I think that's a, a great question. It was something as, as we sat and filled out our rubric and, and did all those things mm -hmm. too, we were like, well, what if we could just combine this one and this one exactly. and, we, and we'd have the, the perfect proposal? Right. Um, Why well, I can't speak specifically for Paul. I can tell you one of the nice things, and I want to compliment Todd because he said it in all these phone conversations. Before we asked um, 
these companies to submit their proposals. We did talk about flexibility. We talked about coming and talking in front of our school board to make sure before that board votes yes that um, you know you do have that ability to ask them, we'd still like to see this. How do you feel about that? And to make sure that you have that flexibility. Again, while I can't speak for, for Paul, um, I have worked with, with other outside consultants in, in similar ways before, and most of them have a lot of flexibility. And I would venture to say, based on my work um, talking with 99 and, and their experience and, and through the reference checks, that you do see a lot of that flexibility built in. And, and again, these proposals, I, I, I don't want to say they just pump them out to, to various school districts, but they are more boilerplate uh, than, than tailored all the time. And so I, I would encourage the Board of Education, should you have any specific questions that you want um, should you vote for Paul um, you know to come in front of you and engage in a contract should you want specific things answered you know please communicate those with me and I will make sure that he does that but um, long-winded answer to your question I, I do believe you have a lot of flexibility and the one thing I would always remind the board with anyone who works for you is you are signing the check at the end of the day and make your feelings known what you want it to be like because you are writing, uh, again, the check, and, and it's what you're paying for as a Board of Education. So great question. I, mean, I think, you know, when we engage with the, uh, the executive search firms, mm -hmm. you know, for the amount of money that we're paying for both that service and this service, mm -hmm. like Kevin said, they're, they're, they're working for us, and they're, right. they're pretty happy to accommodate some of the things that we asked for. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Fantastic. I just want to say thank you to you and your staff because I know you guys spent a lot of time not only reviewing all those proposals, but speaking with all of them and taking the time to go through that, that whole rubric process. That is a, a lengthy process, but I can feel confident uh, moving forward knowing um, that all that effort went into it. So, so thank you so much. All right, at this point, we're going to take a reception of visitors. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We encourage you to keep your comments to th a three minute limit to allow everyone to have an opportunity to speak. Uh, have we received any cards? All right, so we've not received any cards. So if there is anybody out there that actually does want to speak, please uh, walk up to the podium, state your name in your attendance area, and then please provide your public comment. Hi, Chris Hanley. Uh, my son will be going to Herrick next week. Um, in regards to the Ames Web data breach, um, is there, I'd like to see if there's a resource or any identification of any other um, third party or hosted services that the board engages with, uh, the, the administration engages with, uh, with potentially more sensitive uh, information that's out there, uh, including uh, credit card and financial information. Um, just going through a registration debacle with District 99, there's multiple systems with multiple passwords, and it's extremely confusing. And I know in today's age, it can't be avoided, but um, if there's an identification of, of what third party platforms we do use and what data is out there, I think that would be interesting for people to see. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. If it's okay with everybody else, we'll just keep chugging along. Oh, yes. All right. Then uh, we have minutes to approve. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? Nope. All right. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of July 8th, 2019 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the July 8th, 2019 meeting as presented. Um, all right, we have the consent agenda tonight. Are there any items that a board member would like to have considered separately? 
All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved and present as presented in the packet of materials. We have a couple of items up for action tonight. The first one being the approval of a consultant for the facility planning community engagement. Is there a motion to engage in the development of a contract with Paul Hanley as, as the community engagement consultant? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. A any discussion? All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to engage in the development of a contract with Paul Hanley as the community engagement consultant. Is there an motion to engage Lavongo to assist in diabetes management for participants of the district insurance plan? Do I have a motion? So, so moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Okay. Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to engage Lavongo to assist in diabetes management for participants of the district insurance plan. Next, we have the serious hazard designations as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to designate the areas listed below as a hazard, as hazardous for the 2019-2020 year, which makes students who reside within the designated areas eligible for a fee-based transportation services, even though they live within the one and a half mile limit for K through eight. The El Sierra attendance area east of Fairview Avenue uh, Fairmount Attendance Area, east of Fairview Avenue. Henry Puffer Attendance Area, south of the railroad tracks. Henry Puffer Attendance Area, cross street from S-Curve to Haddow. Highland Attendance Area, north of 39th Street. This is a separate item? Yeah. Okay, that's a bullet point there? Yeah, okay. Um, Highland Attendance Area east of Fairview Avenue, Hillcrest Attendance Area north of 55th Street, Indian Trail Attendance Area, Belmont Avenue from 60th Street south to 63rd Street, Indian Trail Attendance Area, Woodward Avenue from 55th Street to 5912 South Woodward, very specific. Indian Trail Attendance Area, uh, uh, Pershing Avenue from 55th Street to 59th Street, Indian Trail Attendance Area south of 63rd Street, Indian Trail Attendance Area 5900 and 5901 Pershing, uh, Herrick Attendance Area north of Ogden Avenue, Herrick Attendance Area south of the railroad tracks, O'Neill Attendance Area south of 63rd Street, O'Neill Attendance Area west of Main Street, St. Joseph Attendance Area, north of Ogden Avenue. St. Joseph Attendance Area, south of the railroad tracks. St. Mary of Goslin Attendance Area, north of Ogden Avenue. And St. Mary of Goslin Attendance Area, south of the railroad tracks. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to designate the areas listed as hazardous for the 2019-2020, which makes the students who reside within the designated areas eligible for fee-based transportation services, even though they live within the one and a half mile limit for K through eight. We have a surplus equipment for iPads and Apple TVs as recommended by the Assistant Superintendent of Technology and Learning. Is there a motion to designate 392 iPads and 292 Apple TVs purchased from between 2011 and 2013 as surplus equipment? So moved. Second. Any discussion? 
more so a question here. I asked Dr. Eichmiller to make sure it's available for the public. Um, there's a note in the memo that the vendor will be responsible for wiping any data on the devices. Uh, do you mind, Dr. Eichmiller, just speaking to what data might be on the devices? Let's see, these were formerly staff uh, iPads, and, and we erase all content settings and the way iOS works, the devices are encrypted, and so when you do that, it really is uh, totally inaccessible. But we do ask the vendors to also uh, go through that process as well, just a means to, to ensure that they're completely wiped and there's no uh, teacher data on the devices whatsoever. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to designate 392 iPads and 292 Apple TVs purchased between 2011 and 2013 as surplus equipment. We have a couple of announcements, um, dates to mark um, here. We have Monday, August 26th will be our budget workshop. That will start at 5 p.m. Uh, that is followed by a board self-evaluation workshop at 6 p.m. That will be held in closed session. Uh, Tuesday, August 27th, there is a district leadership team meeting at 3.45 p.m. at Longfellow. Uh, Monday, September 9th, there's a regular board of education meeting at 7 p.m. right here at Village Hall. And with that, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students, litigation when an action against, affecting, or on behalf of the district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the district finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered into closed meeting minutes. Discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purpose or approval of the body of the minutes or semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 2.06. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The board will now move to close uh, to close session after a short recess at 8:40 p.m. <laughs>